about to witness Sir Clive Sinclair's quantum leap. Last Thursday, it was announced that Sir Clive Sinclair had passed away at the age of 81, following a long and private battle with cancer. Many people lined up to pay tribute, of course, a great deal of whom were folks that people who watch this channel are likely familiar with. The Oliver Twins, Charles Cecil, Lord Alan Sugar, David Braben and so on. A great constant in a lot of the tributes always seemed to be thanking Sir Clive for being part of an introduction to the world of computing, or indeed to the world of gaming. So many people who got their start on the spectrum in various forms, the odd old ones mentioning the ZX81 or even the ZX80. Naturally, the C5 comes up too, as it always does when the man's mentioned, along with a litany of other creations, from the calculators to the QL, the tiny radios and televisions, the black watch to the Zyk. Not all of them necessarily the best of products, but all of them triggering various memories. As chance would have it, I found myself in Cambridge over the weekend, the place where Sinclair was based for many years. There was a chance to have a look over the gates at the Sinclair building, of course, a now largely empty administrative building owned by the Anglia Ruskin University, just off the Mill Road, that's more famous for being Sinclair's base of operations in their most successful period. A chance to relax at Parker's Peace nearby and wonder if this was where Clive took the quantum leap in that one advert, and picture him trundling along in his C5 along the paths. Obviously, there's streets to pound filled with buildings that no doubt produced dozens of Sinclair employees over the years. And of course, the various bars, pubs and restaurants they'd no doubt congregate in, including the Baron of Beef, the one where Sir Clive and Chris Curry had their infamously heated argument. And there's the Centre for Computing History, a place where a great deal of the man and his company's creations are archived and presented, this past weekend adorned with a few more pictures of the man than normal. Some where he has that classic and rather awkward inventor's smile, others where he looked more like a benevolent dictator, depending on mood, no doubt. Summing up Sir Clive Sinclair is quite tricky, really. The various images of the man are just various sides of the coin. There's the carefully crafted image of the great British inventor tinkering away in his shed, the Uncle Clive that brought him fame, recognition and ultimately a knighthood. There's Sir Clive as you see him portrayed by Alexander Armstrong in Micro Men, quick to anger and flinging phones about, beating Chris Curry about the head with a rolled up newspaper, refusing to be defined as the man who bought you Jet Set Willy. This is what my lifetime of achievement has been reduced to. Clive Sinclair, the man who brought you Jet Set fucking Willy. My lad's up to level eight. There's the various pictures, from the one that casts him as rather alone and aloof, trundling on a C5 that everyone had mocked as a failed product, to the handshake with Alan Sugar that seems to sum up in just one agonising and sweaty-handed picture, Clive's weaknesses in the area of cold hard business. There's even the one that the tabloids took interest in in his later years, the one who could occasionally be seen playing poker on television, the one who got in a relationship with and eventually married his favourite lap dancer, the one who popped up every now and again with yet another mode of electronic transport that made everyone recall a C5. He's a very complex figure, in many ways the platonic ideal of a flawed genius. Sir Clive Sinclair was someone whose personality was so wrapped up in all his products, whether good or bad, and whether he wanted them to be or not. One thing that is undoubtedly true is that they most certainly don't make products like that anymore, where such a force of personality, of an individual character at the helm of the ship driving everything, regardless of marketing or demographic or focus group based concerns, rules over everything else. And with the passing of Sir Clive, another link to that time, of the great British inventor, of the Frank Whittles, Trevor Baylisses and John Logie Bairds, has gone with him, and there are desperately few left. Both the positive and what you could call the negative sides contributed to the colossal impact of products like the ZX Spectrum. Take the ridiculously cheap nature of the Speccy, the sheer thriftiness of its design. 
It may have, in the end, been a pile of low-cost and low-quality consumer electronics assembled by a team who did the best they could with the crap they had and then shoved it into the late Rick Dickinson's rather snazzy case. But on the other hand, if it weren't so cheap because of that, perhaps it wouldn't have had such a huge impact, helping to build an entire IT industry, allowing people from all walks of life to learn how to code, whether they were in their bedroom or not. Perhaps it wouldn't have been so easy to essentially build your own either, the result being a whole load of clones of the Spectrum that made it to places all over the world, particularly far behind the Iron Curtain, years before anything else could make such an impression. This role of the ZX Spectrum as some sort of computing answer to the AK-47 is probably one that should be talked about more. You still see the impact now, just as you still see a sizeable amount of people creating great fins on a ZX Spectrum almost 40 years after the machine's original release. We're still tinkering. It goes without saying that a lot of us, myself included, would probably be doing something totally different if it wasn't for one form or another of the ZX Spectrum, whether it was a form that Sir Clive had a hand in or not. As I've been saying these words, one of, well, thousands of ZX Spectrum games has been largely playing in the background. A Day in the Life, a 1985 game from Micro Mega. In this game, you actually get to play as Sir Clive himself. You have to get him ready for his big day when he goes off to be knighted by the Queen at the palace. Is it a particularly good game? Well, no, not really. It's like if you took Pac-Man and tried to make it a flick screen style game instead of an arcadey single screen title. It's filled with classically frustrating touches from games of the era, comically hard difficulty with the absence of any sort of curve, sequences that often require you to be robotically precise and pixel perfect in your movements, some glaring examples of the classic spectrum colour clash, things that don't look fatal but actually are. There's a lot, and yet there's a personality to the game even beyond being able to play as Sir Clive that makes it enticing, a quintessential specky title, attributes shared by a hell of a lot of other games and pieces of software on the computer, from the stone cold classics to the <laughs> not so classic. As much as Sir Clive wasn't enamoured with his machine becoming so well known for games, the unique character of them were down to what he had built, and if it hadn't existed, well, it's hard to think about that. Something like Jet Set Fucking Willy is as much an extension of Sir Clive as it is a great game, because of how definitive it is to the system. The British computer industry would not be the same without him, the games industry would be utterly unrecognisable, and I'd be making videos about Pinpon or something. So long, Uncle Sir Clive. Bye for now.